Uh, we're delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Tim tonight to give this session as part of our Sustainability Week here um, on behalf of the Students' Union, Falmouth and Exeter and Falmouth and Exeter University. So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Jake Causley and I'm the Sustainability Coordinator for Falmouth University. Um, and it's been a pleasure putting on this week and working with people uh, like uh, Tim, Zach and Matt who have come along tonight. So I can't wait to introduce you to them. Um, just a quick note that, yes, as I said, this is part of a bigger campaign week we're running here at the universities. Um, it's entirely digital and there's still a heap of events going on right up to Friday evening. So um, just a brief mention that if you fancy some more sustainability related um, content, um, completely free to attend to the public as well, head to this URL at the bottom there, the su.org forward slash sustainability week, uh, where you can find out ways to get um, a ticket for those events. Just a brief mention, um, this theme this week of Sustainability Week, uh, we are drawing on the sustainable development goals a little bit um, because they're widely seen as a measure for sustainability. For those of you who don't know, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs uh, were a blueprint um, that was introduced in 2016 by the United Nations and adopted by United Nations States. Um, it's a blueprint, provide a blueprint for a better planet uh, for people and the environment. Um, so these 17 goals, um, with objectives in each that we must hit if we are to achieve sustainability um, in the near future and it can't come too quickly. Um, and I've been pulling together a few that are relevant um, for each session and today's talk, to be honest, encompasses to me uh, what sustainability is. Um, the crisis that we're in um, is major and um, it's super great that so many people are engaged in it and ultimately um, sustainability is a matter across all these 17 goals of importance uh, when we concern the climate and ecological crisis so that's why all 17 are on the screen today. Just a tiny bit of housekeeping, um, this event is being recorded uh, for future use um, and thank you everyone who's muted themselves and turned your cameras off, that's brilliant. Uh, we will welcome you to come back on um, in the open discussion section after Tim has spoken. Uh, if you have any questions in the meantime, myself and Zach are going to be watching uh, the chat, so pop it in the chat um, and we'll address it at the end or you can come on to talk about it yourself. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Matt Osmond um, and he's going to introduce our guest speaker today, so thank you Matt. Thanks Jake and uh, yeah, we're delighted to have Tim Hewlett joining us tonight, who a number of us here first met uh, so to speak, through his recent Q&A with XR Working Class, which you can see on YouTube in a podcast called um, Let's Talk About Science. Uh, but also I'd like to welcome our friend and colleague from the student-led Mobilise Peace Movement, closely aligned with Scientist Rebellion. And Zach, uh, Zach is also going to be joining us for a panel at 1pm tomorrow uh, to talk about the work of Mobilise Peace and for four of us to reflect on, on what they're doing. So uh, Zach's going to introduce Tim Hewlett, Dr. Tim Hewlett. So over to you, Zach, and thanks both for joining us. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, I'm going to introduce um, Scientist Rebellion and I'm going to introduce Tim. Sorry, this feels a bit like pass the parcel from Jake to Matt to me, to Tim. But anyway, um, so uh, Tim is a co-founder of Scientist Rebellion and I'm one of his colleagues there. We're a group of scientists and academics who believe that we should expose the reality and the severity of the climate and ecological emergency by engaging in nonviolent civil disobedience. So unless those best placed to understand the climate crisis um, act as if it's an emergency, we cannot expect the public to do so or even believe the emergency. Some people believe that, you know, this would be appearing alarmist um, but we are terrified by what we see, and it is both vital and right to express our fears openly um, in line with telling the truth. So um, giving the talk this evening is Dr. Tim Hewlett, as I said, a co-founder of Scientist Rebellion. Uh, Tim is an active uh, researcher in astrophysics at a university in Chile, although working remotely at the moment, um, and is key in Scientist Rebellion. So yeah, I'll pass it over to you, Tim, to uh, terrify us with the science. Thanks, Zach. Um, OK, I'll, I'll try and share my screen. Um, does that work? Um, yes, that's perfect, Tim. That's, that's perfect. 
Great. Um, well, thanks everyone for, for coming and, and thanks for having me here. Um, uh, this is going to be a cheerful talk. It's going to be really, really upbeat. Um, so what, I, what I'll try to do is to, um, I'll lay out what I think are a bunch of broad research areas of the climate crisis um, and how they relate to human activity. So what are the causes um, and what are the consequences? Um, in terms of drought, inundation, starvation, uh, all those kind of pleasant things. Um, but I, I'll, I'll try and finish on a bit of an optimistic note um, and, and talk about you know, what, what can we actually do about it? How did we get here and what can we do? Um, and what is the case for nonviolence and for disobedience? Um, and I may personalize that a little bit and talk about the case of scientists in particular. Uh, We'll see how much time we've got going. But yeah, I'm looking forward to the questions at the end. So I'll try to keep this for about half an hour or so. Um, so uh, yeah, some some kind of core facts and basics about, about climate science. Um, so I think a, a good starting point is, is a lot of people kind of say, well, can we be sure as to what the cause of this is? Uh, and one thing that I find really convincing is that uh, we've known about the greenhouse effect for about 150 years. Um, this really isn't in any way controversial or doubted in science. Um, it's, it's a nonsense to claim so. Um, so there are other things which can influence the climate of the Earth. For instance, the, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun changes a little bit over time as the distribution of other planets in the solar system change. Um, but this is kind of thousand year time scales. And if you have a look at this, um whew, that's just that's rocketing up that is that is not a thousand year time scale um that is you've made a prediction of what's going to happen if you put carbon in the atmosphere and then you've seen it happen in real time um so it, an, an, another really important thing to bear in mind i think is that um pe people often I, I think it's very hard to keep a a, a sense of why is it that such a small temperature increase uh, can be so catastrophic. So if you're talking about the need to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees or two degrees, why, why should that matter so much? Um, and part of the answer is that when we talk about global average temperatures, um, that kind of hides the reality of how the world warms. Um, so temperature increases over land are, are two or three times higher typically than the kind of global average increase. Uh, and this kind of, you can understand this because uh, your oceans, for instance, are being warmed at the surface layer. And then those, that heat can get distributed through the ocean by currents and by motion of the water. But land isn't like that. Land, you just you just heat up the surface layer uh, and it, it, it retains that heat at least throughout the day um, efficiently. So if you're talking about a global average increase of temperature of three or four degrees centigrade, you can well be looking at average increases over land of 10 degrees, um, which can well mean spikes in temperature, heat waves, um, far more extreme even than that. Um, so there's a kind of, this is just a schematic to show what that really means um, in basic terms. You, you shift this average temperature and your extreme becomes almost the new normal and you find new extremes that you couldn't have predicted existed until you found them. Uh, and it's really hard to say what the consequences of those um, of those more extreme uh, changes will be. Um, one of the kind of most important facts I think about the climate to appreciate, and it's a complex fact, it's a really complex idea, um, is that every part of the climate system effectively is connected to every other part. Uh, you can't really consider any one part of the um, climate in isolation. So if you put CO2 into the atmosphere, it doesn't just have one effect, and that one effect doesn't stay just as it is. There are knock-on consequences to each of them, which I think are kind of demonstrated in this um, figure here. Um, so, you know, that's that's a kind of quick introduction um, to give a little bit more sort of context for this. Uh, I think a useful statistic is that the last time CO2 levels were this high, temperatures were about three degrees hotter centigrade and sea levels were 20 or 25 meters higher. Um, now that was 
through three million years ago or so. You can't make a, a direct comparison between today and then, uh, but that gives you a sense of, of the kind of scales we're heading for if we don't even manage to, if we don't manage to subtract carbon from the atmosphere, um, let alone add more to it. Uh, we're living through the Earth's sixth mass extinction event, so so we've done as much devastation in the last 50, 100 years um, as has happened only six times in the lab. About once every 100 million years, something of this magnitude occurs, uh, and we're doing it. Uh, humans are. Um, although the term we is a little bit confusing in that, I think, uh, it hides the real perpetrators. Um, most of the people on Earth aren't significantly contributing to this. There is a tiny minority who are disproportionately destroying everything. Um, and the consequences of that are likely to be severe. Um, it's because of the kind of non-linearity that I'm talking about in this system here, it's, it's really hard to make firm predictions. And so a lot of scientists will stay away from talking about, you know, billions of people may face starvation. Uh, billions of people may be forced to leave their homes um, because there's so many kind of social expectations wrapped up in those predictions that scientists aren't comfortable saying it. Um, but what I'll try to do is, is to kind of paint a picture of, of what climate science seems to be suggesting is, is, the f is what the future holds for us. Um, and I don't think it takes a great act of imagination to figure out how devastating that will be for human life um, and beyond. Uh, so here are just a few quotes by clever people uh, who've dedicated their lives to understanding um, these complex social realities and, and the climate itself. Um, and I think, you know, they're pretty stark. They speak for themselves. I couldn't word it better. Uh, but lots of lots of people who study this end up realizing that we're talking about the decay of, of human civilization and society if we're not careful here. Uh, so let's let's get into the kind of nitty gritty of it a little bit more um, and start with my favorite topic, which is nonlinear feedbacks. Um, so this this is basically um, related to what I was just saying. The climate is a nonlinear system. Uh, now, some of those some of the changes which are caused by a heating world. Um, they can be they can have knock-on consequences on, on particular other parts of the, of the climate system. So I'm going to give a simple example, um, which is of the loss of ice. Uh, so the plot you can see in the top left is uh, the the extent in, I think, September of the sea ice in the Arctic. Um, and you can see the last few years plotted on it. It's probably many of you have seen this plot. Um, how rapidly and ac how accelerating uh, the decline of the sea ice is. Um, now, this has a direct heating effect on the climate immediately, um, because if you have less ice, then you reflect less of the sun's energy back out into space. And if you reflect less of the energy away, the Earth warms up. Um, so there was a prediction last year that said that about 0.4 centigrade should be expected to be added just from that process alone. Um, we're looking at the loss of the Arctic in, in 10 or 15 years, most likely, uh, just extrapolating from this from this loss of ice. Um, so, it, you know, if, if you have a goal of keeping temperatures below 1.5 centigrade, we're already at about 1.2. If you add 0.4 more, you, you're already crossing that threshold. Um, and it, this this bottom right schematic is is basically just showing you what the eventual consequences of that are because the the or could be because uh, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Uh, there are multiple, there are lots of different forms of, of potential feedbacks within the climate system which reinforce each other. Um, so we don't just see the melting of the Arctic ice, but we see the burning of the forests, we see burning peat fires, we see the death of the coral reefs, we see changing currents, um, we see the permafrost. Um, signs that that is starting to collapse now. Um, these are really worrying signs, and I think perhaps more than any other area, for me, this motivates the need for instantaneous action. We we really have to be. There isn't any time to waste. We're we're at, we risk losing all control over the future of the climate system if we don't get a grip on this now. Um, 
yeah, so it, this is an existential threat to, to civilization in a nutshell. Um, another aspect of a climate crisis, this will be a, a real sort of, I'm, I'm going to rush through each of these points because I just want to paint with broad strokes um, so that we can discuss what that actually means. Um, in terms of the ecological crisis, uh, the Living Planet Index says that we've lost about 70% of uh, vertebrates in the last 50 years. So that means 70% of the mammals, um, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, um, other groups that I can't recall right now, the fish, um, have have died in the last few decades. And, and that's not you know, that's not just because of global heating. In fact, for the most part, that's because of habitation destruction, um, overfishing and farming, um, uh, and, and other forms of human activity, um, destroying the forests, for instance. Um, now, first of all, these these effects can also be quite nonlinear. Um, so I've, I've had the BBC um, headline there of how one heat wave killed a third of a bat species in Australia. Uh, if you pass certain kind of thresholds in temperature, new things start happening, as I said, that you don't necessarily expect, um, including potentially kind of mass dyings of species, which have knock on effects further down the ecosystem. Um, this this plot in the bottom right, I, I find terrifying. Uh, this is a uh, study of, of a study of studies. So this is an average of 70 studies where they looked at the rate of decline of uh, insects from the world. Uh, and there's there's some debate about these numbers. We haven't got a complete global census, uh, but the kind of indication is that we're, we've lost about half of the insects in the last few decades, and that they're declining at a rate of around about 2% per year uh, currently, which means yeah, we haven't got very much longer <laughs> uh, to stop the insects from dying out. And, and if you lose the insects, then you lose most of your pollinators. Yeah, that has clear obvious impacts immediately for human society. Um, and again, these are being destroyed by by pesticides, by habitat loss, by just stupid policy and stupid incentives at a governmental political level, uh, which are, are utterly inadequate to the scale of the threat that we face. Uh, so David Attenborough, everyone's the world's granddad, uh, talking about uh, the interconnectedness of the web of life and how important this is for us and not just for it. There's a moral case that, that can and should be made here, but but it's even more extensive than that. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit now about kind of direct human consequences of, of some of these projections and predictions. Um, so, you know, we are well on course for at least four degrees of warming this century. Uh, so that means, you know, probably two degrees before 2050. Um, it, it could be as much as, you know, maybe even six degrees centigrade this century. Uh, but you don't need to go anywhere near that far in, in temperature rise before you see how catastrophic the consequences are. Um, so this this figure here is showing you how, how droughts change um, as a function of temperature. And bottom right, you can just see that you've just got five times as many droughts over more well over half of the Earth. Um, so, so you can get droughts in huge parts of the world, which are, um, they last essentially forever. I, you, you're in a state of perpetual drought. Um, and I don't think it takes much imagination to figure out what that means for people. If you can't access water, if you can't grow crops, um, you're looking at, at best, uh, a mass refugee crisis and at worst, uh, mass dyings. Um, so a, a similar kind of figure just reinforcing this is the number of days per year above the dead, deadly threshold of heat for humans. Um, so huge parts of the world have become effectively uninhabitable um, once you've become f a few degrees warmer. Uh, and I like this quote um, because the more you learn, the more you appreciate, I think, how how severe this is um, and how radically things have to change. Um, starvation, so so hunger and 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 eco agricultural system collapses, a, a bit of a uh, it's quite a complex area. 
um, you have to do really complex analyses and, and not all of the literature agrees on this. There is a, a good amount of divergence. Um, but there are still certain kind of fairly concrete things that we can say and, and I hope it can be understood. Um, so in this plot, for instance, what you're looking at here is how does the yield of some crop change as the temperature um, increases? And you see that this isn't a linear thing either. If you cross some threshold in temperature, sometimes the crops just die. Um, not particularly unexpected. Um, so this was another study that kind of looks at these critical temperatures and, and what, what you have to do if you if you want to really understand how food production will change across the world, you need to look at geographical maps of, of how the temperature is likely to change as a function of time. Um, and you have to look at where the farms are and what they're growing. Um, so there's a lot of data to go into it and there's, it's a complex analysis to kind of figure out what's happening with drought, what's happening with heat stress, what crops are there, uh, how many people do they feed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you see that in some of these crops, uh, by mid-century, you could be looking at around 50% declines. Um, and this this isn't just isolated to one study. Uh, I don't have time to show you lots of literature, but but there are a number of studies that say similar things. Um, and, and the kind of real risk, I think that the major concern around uh, loss of food production is that something like 25% of the world's crops produce about three quarters of the world's staple crops. Um, so it, it only takes a kind of small-ish coincidence of several really bad heat waves and droughts in these important food producing regions of the world simultaneously for you to get massive impacts of the entire world. Um, you know, gone are the days when it, if you had a, a, a local drought or something, the local people would, would suffer um, as a consequence. We have completely globalized networks of food now. Um, so it's all sorts of questions there about how do rich and powerful nations respond um, if they co can no longer supply their nation with food. Um, it, what does that mean for war and a global society? And what does it mean for the, the scale of famine that we could face um, in the really quite near future? Um, so this is a, a quote by, the, I think, the lead author of a, a study I read recently, which which made me really laugh um, because it was it was commissioned by Lloyds Bank. Uh, and basically, yeah, the conclusion of the study is you may well see basically a global collapse in society by 2040 because of this, this the shocks to political and economic systems that come about from crop failures. Um, and the conclusion of the report was, so you might not get your money back from your insurance things, <laughs> which just uh, how to spectacularly miss the point. Um, beautiful, but 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 kind of emblematic of a of a system which is so uh, myopic that it can't see it can't look beyond the confines of its own definition of success to realize that that's not a catastrophe because you lose your money. It's a catastrophe because you killed everyone who could have paid it back. Um, so moving on, <laughs> uh, inundation. So if we're talking about rising seas and flooding, um, here's just a picture I, I, I put into a, a uh, sea level rise uh, simulator thing to, to say if, if sea levels rise by three meters, which is quite plausible by the end of century, what does a bit of the coast of Britain look like? Um, now, I looked at Falmouth, actually, and it, it wasn't that dramatic. And I thought, well, um, that's surprising. I don't know the geography of Falmouth, if you've got cliffs or something or um, whatever. But I chose this from a previous talk in the end. Uh, a friend just moved to Bognor Regis. Uh, I've got friends in Brighton and yeah. Lots of it will simply disappear. Um, so often people think of, of climate breakdown as a thing that affects um, people in, in, in other countries, other parts of the world. That's that's very much not just the case. It, it is more severe in, in the global south and, and uh, as a function of poverty. Um, but you're also looking at a refugee crisis from rising seas alone of millions of people in the UK, millions of people internally displaced. Um, in the coming decades, uh, certainly this cent well, very likely this century. Um, again, this is this is a non-linear effect. This is uh, as sea levels rise, flooding gets exponentially worse uh, with with coastal rise uh, with sea level rise. Um, 
So we're on the cusp of this becoming a really significant problem. Um, and obviously for some parts of the world, this is genocide. Um, if you live on a low-lying island nation, um, low-lying island, um, and the rest of the world refuses to cut its carbon emissions uh, so that your home sinks, your nation is, is uh, engulfed by the seas, well, that's genocide as far as I can see. Uh, migration, this, this is saying something quite similar to a couple of the plots further up. Um, the dark shaded regions on this are, are basically not the dark black bit, but the shaded darker regions um, are telling you that by 2070 uh, in this model, uh, those regions are expected to have basically Sahara like conditions, um, mean annual temperatures that for basically all of history, human history, humans haven't really lived in. Uh, maybe, you know, nomadic tribes or something, but nothing like the population levels that these areas have. These, these areas contain billions of humans. Um, so the kind of suggestion is that billions of people will have to leave their homes from these areas of the world um, or they will die. Um, yeah, I never thought I'd quote a lord. It's not very in line with my politics, but um, there you go. Lots, lots of people are starting to appreciate how, how severe this is. Um, and finally, just, you know, I, I think the Syrian civil war kind of ties together a lot of these different elements, um, because what you had in, in that case was a, a historic drought, you know, the worst on instrumental record, um, very clearly in line with climate uh, climate change with with climate breakdown um very much a consequence of of climate breakdown um and what you saw in that case was from i think two-thirds of the country uh about three quarters of the crops and livestock died as a consequence of this drought this this heat wave um which lasted for five years by the way um that in that displaced about one and a half million people internally people going to the cities looking for work looking for food um which sparked the civil unrest and the war that that we all know about um and i you know I, I think it's interesting as well to first of all this this was a a climate catastrophe um and that needs to be understood but but even more broadly than that the knock-on effects the non-linear effects of this you had five million people or so displaced around the world and we're still reeling politically from that um we're looking at a crisis in terms of the number of people who are forced to flee their homes. We're looking at a crisis hundreds of times more severe. Uh, if we could barely hold together democracy as it is currently constituted under five million people, even you see the rise of the far right of Trump and Brexit and Boris Johnson, whoever else. Um, that's a worrying sign for the state of our politics. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll rush through this ne next bit a little bit, I think, because I, I want to open things up to conversation. Um, but I, I find this this figure really quite uh, telling uh, about the kind of political situation we find ourselves in, where despite all the warnings, despite endless agreements and diplomacy and, and international accords, this line keeps going up. It keeps on accelerating as it goes up. Um, uh, and with devastating consequences, um, which which suggests to me that appealing to leaders to make better decisions out of the goodness of their hearts is is a desperately naive approach to politics. Um, it's not going to work. We need something a lot more rapid and radical. Um, yeah, I'll skip over some of this. I think I, I wanted to talk a bit about the role of money in politics um and quite why it's so corrupted but especially in britain now i don't think many people will need much co convincing that politics is corrupted um or that our governments are are engaging in in corruption um which threatens our lives um so let's talk about nonviolence civil disobedience and so first of all you know what is it why is it effective and, and is it effective empirically? You know, coming at this from a scientific perspective, um, what do we need for this to work uh, for a given definition of working? Um, 
so so nonviolent civil disobedience is a really broad uh, term. It's a really broad idea, um, and it, it can apply in lots of different contexts. Um, you, know, you can be fighting against systemic racism or, or, or patriarchy, or you can be facing a, a direct regime, an autocratic regime or a democratic regime. Lots of different times over millennia, um, nonviolent civil disobedience has been used to, to erode or break down or, or some system or political ideology um, or to win power um, directly. Um, so in, in a nutshell, I mean, it, it is just, it, it is the idea that to sustain their power, any regime requires some degree of consent from the population, right? Um, if you, it, it's kind of hidden in plain sight because you go about your life, um, you, are, you are fitting into society in the modes that it is designed to, to sort of work within. Um, which means that civil disobedience can take on a huge range of different types of activities. Um, all right, so it can be showing and just expressing your distaste by marching, um, and it can be it can be teachings like like this essentially that that we're trying to spread information and talk about how we can approach these problems. Um, it can be moral acts like like hunger strikes that that kind of erode the moral legitimacy um of some some regime it can be direct action um it can be all sorts of things right um uh wondering if there's anything more to say uh, if something more comes back to me then i'll stay there um and there are lots of examples of movements uh using nonviolent civil disobedience and they're accelerating by the way there, there are more uh, civil disobedience campaigns in the world today than at any other point in, in history, as far as I'm aware. Um, and so, uh, yeah, in, in recent years, we've seen kind of the Arab Spring, the Occupy movement, Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, lots of different movements um, cropping up and using these tactics. Um, and there's, there's a reason, right? Um, it's because actually it is surprisingly effective. Um, Lots of the literature, there is some disagreement amongst the literature as with any area. Um, but it, these are some sort of ideas as to why nonviolent civil disobedience can be so effective um, in the literature. And, and part of it is just that if, if you if you have a, a violent campaign, you tend to only mobilize sort of 20, 30 year old men. Um, and we're not that good. <laughs> there's, there's not enough of us. Um, and we're not that good decision makers. You make better decision makers if you have a broader subset of society. Um, and if you mobilize more people, you're far more likely to succeed. Um, so uh, there's there's a there's a power to nonviolence in that it is automatically seen as legitimate, um, and repression of it can very often backfire. Um, so. Yeah, if, if you have a peaceful demonstration and the government responds with violence, um, people understand quite innately and quite deeply how unfair and wrong that is. Um, you know, a, another reason um, for it is that if you if you do a violent uprising, you'll probably replace whatever system you have with a violent system. Um, it tends to be that if you if you use just this this more passive refusal to um, engage or to accept the world as it is, um, you tend to create some the space for something better um, in its place. Um, so lots of different kinds of people endorse uh, this kind of action. Um, and the, the kind of empirical perspective on this, I think, is, is this is from a recent Chenoweth paper, um, which uh, there's there's often i think in in um extinction rebellion people think that what the literature says is that you need to mobilize 3.5 percent of the population in order to win it's not true um it, it is the case that if you mobilize at least 3.5 percent at the peak of a campaign you're very likely to succeed um but there are more complexities to this as well um the type of struggle you're waging matters um so, so for instance, I mean, if, if you're if you're trying to start an uprising in some country, um, and the United States says no, 
and funds your opponents um, and offers support to them, you're, you're not that likely to succeed. You're going to need a, a larger section of the population, very likely, to rise up to be successful. Um, or you can invert those those that scenario and, and get a kind of opposite response. Um, the point about the climate crisis is that it is so uh, all encompassing, it's everywhere, um, that any one nation can't solve this by itself and any one movement in one part of the world can't do so either. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we're doing at, at Scientists Rebellion, for instance, is uh, because of that fact, because we have a global issue, we need a global response. Um, and scientists are really well placed to do this. So I'm making a direct appeal now. Um, we have internationalist communities. Um, we uh, we are very well placed by a number of means to support and engage in civil disobedience. Um, and yeah, and this this has to be globally organized and coordinated in order to have a chance of of actually changing the system globally as it is um, to something more sustainable. Um, feels really appropriate, but I finished on the word sustainable there and sustainability week. Um, so I might just stop there, I think. And thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Perfectly done, Tim. Perfect. <laughs> um, I will say that um, I think Zach is having a bit of tech trouble, so I thought I'd bring you out. Um, hopefully he can come back in and join us. But um, thanks so much. That was, that was staggering. Um, some really, really great content that um, I didn't even know about. And it's always, I always find it super refreshing to come back to these talks, not only to see, see similar minded people, but it's also like, um, almost instill that drive in me again. Um, so it's really great to hear from you, Matt. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Thank you. Uh, that was that was fantastic. Thank you, Tim. And uh, I'm I'm definitely busting with questions, but I'm also aware that other people might have them, and I thought I might hold mine back for a moment and just see if anyone else would like to 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 come in with a question for Tim. Um, otherwise, I'll be straight in there. <laughs> Very happy to be. <laughs> I agree. Great point. Um, so, guys, if you like, you can um, post questions in the chat, um, but we welcome you to, you know, come on camera if you wish. Um, uh, those of you who know Teams, there's a raise hand function, but I'm sure we can uh, keep it pretty civil without that. So um, if you'd like to ask him a question, do just please um, say your name and come May forward. I... Sorry, Jeff. Oh, sorry, <laughs> if not, me and Matt have tons of questions. Yeah. So. I, I'd love to ask him a question just to give people a chance to come, because I know what it's like. You need, you know, that's a big that's a big thing that we, people have just downloaded. And I, I think questions don't easily spring back out of a space like that. But one of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking, Tim, was a conversation I had with Zach last last week. And um, I, I think when it, in the October rebellion that, with the Extinction Rebellion, I might have got this wrong, but I think I remember that there was about 100 people who went up to it from Falmouth and Penyon. Uh, and our friends here will remember if I that's rose tinted. I think that was about right. What I, what my, my sense is that the, in the kind of mobilization campaign, very naturally, especially your role as scientists, it makes complete sense. You're communicating the information to people. It is this serious. It's this serious. What I feel is if, if everyone I knew who understood it was serious and getting worse took part in nonviolent civil disobedience, I think we'd have a thousand or two thousand going up from a town the size of family. And I wonder if a kind of tipping point that we're at, that uh, there's a great quote by George Monbiot where he says there's a whole generation that have gone straight from denial to despair without pausing in the middle. And um, because neither denial nor despair cost you anything. They don't lay any claim on you. And I and I wondered about for people who just feel overwhelmed, who for people who just feel that line is going to go up, whatever I do, so I'm not going to put my livelihood on the line. Whether you had anything to say to people who sort of get that it's serious, but don't take part in action and, and perhaps feel overwhelmed. Or... Yeah, um, thanks for that question. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think I think one thing that gives me hope in all of this is that we're, we're looking at, I, I've used the word nonlinear about 100 times in that talk. Um, we're looking at really, really fast nonlinear processes. But there's one thing which is faster, and that's social response. Um, so, you know, we've, we've all seen, okay, we've all seen with, with COVID uh, just how powerful an exponential curve can be. 
uh, right? So, so people are used to thinking in terms of the R rate. If you have an R rate of, of one or greater, um, curve exponentially increases, you're in a bad place. The maths is the same for a social revolution. Um, if you, if each person here brought in one or more people to the climate movement, and each of them brought in one or more people, you'd have an exponential growth in the size of the movement. And it doesn't take very many people before saying no, before a system cannot function anymore. Um, that's the power of civil disobedience. Yeah, because even if people don't agree with you, at some point they say, well, this is ridiculous. We have to change. Look, look we can't function as a society if this is what's going on. And a lot of the questions, a lot of the um the threats that we face as a species and as individuals come about because of social dynamics um, that, that are layered on top of the, the climate crisis. Um, so certainly in deteriorating environmental conditions means that um, there, are, there are consequences directly for human societies in terms of how you expect people to behave politically, how, how people are, are forced to act in those conditions. Um, but but, but still, it's it's a function of human choices, structures, and political power. Um, and so, if we if we can create um, a powerful social movement towards um, uh, justice and equality, um, meaning that uh, then you you can forestall lots of these worst effects of of, of climate breakdown. Um, you can prepare in terms of. Uh, what what housing and things that you can offer there's there's so much work to be done as well but anyone who's saying oh well you know ooh, i'm not not sure about the future with the, um it, there's there's so much socially good work to be done um there's no limit <laughs> um so so yeah i i think that there is a a real um capacity if 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 we had a rational government and a, a, a rational politics um, there will be all kinds of solutions that we will be investing in um, and, and trying to make function, uh, like rewilding efforts, like like new approaches to agriculture, um, to forestall these problems. Um, and if you had something like that, you can see social dynamics, social tipping points that I think would give people a lot of hope and get a lot of people more involved um, in creating those solutions. Humans are remarkably adaptable. There is hope. But I, it is hard to see. I, I've despaired plenty of times, so I understand it. Fantastic answer. Thanks. Great, uh, Matt. We've got some questions. If you like, I'll bring them in. Yeah, you, you. That would be great. Thanks, awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go, guys. Apologies if I missed you up. I'm going to go by order of who I saw. So, Giuseppe, would you like to uh, unmute and ask your question? I think you've raised your hand. Hello. Can you hear me? Right. Yes, that's great. Hi. Um. I didn't, yeah, I did not have to put together my question, um, but I'll try. Um, say um, I am like one of this person um, on the other side of the um, of this fight, and I own a um, mining company. Um, I'm a businessman of high profile of a mining company, and um, I've been to this talk and. Um, I, I, I appreciate your time and stuff and I would say like yeah climate might be warming and all of all that you said is might be true um but um I still make a lot of money out of my business and I'm not gonna stop um I don't care if the climate is warming if people are dying and whatever else um there's still a lot of um resources under under the ground which I still want to get out of it and um, make profit of, and um, and even anyway, there's still uh, technologies uh, advancing which will m maybe save us uh, from um, uh, carbon um, emission and whatever. Um, maybe a new machinery in the next ten years will be invented and will save us from uh, um, the carbon um, and. Um, yeah, what were you what were you gonna answer to that? Um, um, or even like um, to just go on with that? Like, even if a lot of people are gonna die, like some rich people are still gonna be are gonna be able to survive. Um, so the population, human population, is gonna be helped or whatever. But some people are still gonna survive. 
for however long to look. But like, yeah, why, why are you going to answer to like the person that is not going to agree with you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's there's a few kind of aspects of that to unpack. Um, let's say let's take the first part first. So you were saying if you were a a you know a, a mine owner or a, you know someone who works in fossil fuels, um, well you know first of all, I I would take the view that we all behave in a particular way in a particular system. And if we were in a different system, we wouldn't behave that way. Um, now, there's there's a logic to um, market capitalism that we live in, um, which means that the people who are making the decisions at the tops of companies, for instance, often don't really feel like they have any choice. They know that it's wrong by and large, but they 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 also know that if they if they didn't do the environmentally destructive thing, they would be replaced by shareholders, by somebody who was willing to do it. Um, so they have a kind of rationale for, well, what's the point in me doing anything? I don't really have power. Um, so, you know, I would want to treat them with with the sympathy of, of understanding that they are trapped in a, in a difficult, in an impossible situation. But at the same time, I would say this this is coming, whether you want it to or not. You can bury your head in the sand, and say, well, you know, I, I'm not going to change actually because right now, it, it, right now this benefits me, and and I don't see any way that it actually will create real change. Um, you can say that, but we are going to stop using. Well, I strongly believe that we will stop using fossil fuels soon, um, and there will be a reckoning. Um, so, you know, it, it, after great travesties. Um, people are held to account. It doesn't normally happen beforehand, uh, though it should. Um, so so I would say to that person, you know, I understand you're in a difficult position, but you have to be on our side or your culpability endangers you. And I don't mean that as I'm strictly nonviolent from both a, a pragmatic and a principal perspective. Um, but if we're talking about social dynamics, um, there's something to think about there. Now, now there was a different part of, of the question where you, you talked about you know, oh, I can imagine that maybe some uh, technological fits might save us. And that's super appealing. I mean, especially to, to scientists, I think, as well, the idea that some magical fix is going to come along and, um, and and we won't have to worry about any of this stuff. It's, oh, you just had to toss sulfur in the atmosphere. No worries. Um, yeah, apart from the fact that when you look into a lot of these ideas, they, they're really dangerous, they're really scary, really dangerous ideas for the most part. Um, Apart from anything else, some of them I think are just logically fallacious. Um, so if we're talking about carbon capture and storage technologies, for instance, if you want to if you want to build enough machines to suck carbon out of the atmosphere on a relevant time scale, um, well, where are you going? How are you going to build all of those materials? What kind of mining expectations do you need for that? What kind of environmental destruction do you have to cause to save the environment? Um, so it, it seems to me most of these ideas, once you look into them, are actually non-starters, but they're really appealing precisely because they give us the illusion that we can do this without sacrificing something, without giving something up. Um, and at the heart of, of civil disobedience is a willingness to give something up. Um, you know, that's that's one of the reasons I, I'll i be going on hunger strike with the Scientist Rebellion Global um, Action from March the 25th, 5th to 28th. Um, is partly because I just want to show the world that if you understand this stuff, you are willing to give stuff up. Just like if you understand that to control the spread of coronavirus, you have to stay home. Um, you understand that, you give something up because you understand that it fits to a better cause. Um, yeah, that rambled a bit in the end, but something like that. <laughs> it's a great comparison. Yeah, that, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> It's a great comparison to you know um, doing our bit, staying at home um, to control something. Um, I love that sort of analogy. Um, I'm just going to jump to. I know two people got their hands up. Just quickly from the chat, um, Joe asks, "Can you say a bit more about how drought caused the civil war? Is this something? Is there something she can read about on this?" Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not any kind of expert in this, um, but I tell you what, I'll, I'll put a couple of papers in the chat. Um, in a moment, which uh, you might find interesting. Um, the so so let me say in a, a kind of quite general way, um, 
there is a really strong correlation between political unrest, civil unrest, um, and uh, drought or, or food prices, um, uh, which kind of measures the availability of food. Um, so in, in a sense, it's just fitting to a broad trend and it's not unexpected that if you have a five year drought, uh, I mean, good luck with your society. Five years without rain. I mean, it's Britain. I can't imagine that. Can't imagine 10 minutes. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I think and, and also, I mean, if you look at any one individual case, you'll find a, a great deal of complexity in there and, and lots of possible bits of explanation. So if you want to look at, at Syria, for instance, um, you could argue that you've got a tinderbox of kind of social, um, it was ready for social unrest in some sense, you could argue, before um, the drought. And so it's it's kind of, it's a com combinatorial factor. It's not the only cause of something. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll put those, I'll put some papers in the chat as soon as I get a chance. Great, thanks, Tim. I'm gonna go to Leon next. He was next with his hand. Leon, if you'd like to unmute or unvideo, you're welcome. I think you're still muted, Leon. Still muted, yeah. Sorry, Leon. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Feel free to type it if you are. Uh, you can. Ah, oh, strange. Uh, maybe check the little uh, dot 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 at the top for your audio settings. But um, I'll go to Sarah while you're sorting that out. So, Sarah. Maybe. Mm. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Okay. Uh, um, uh, well, I appreciate that you just said about how you're going to go on hunger strike. I've been out on the streets and sitting in rows myself. Um, I, I'm just querying whether you think it's necessary for a lot of people to be arrested uh, and to go to prison, in fact, to be effective. I know I know that the sacrifice, this element of sacrifice is important. I'm just wondering about that element of, of you know, how far people need to prepare themselves for prison, I think. Yeah, arrest and prison, yeah. Great, yeah, thank you. Good question. Um, and thank you for your activism. Um, so, yeah, basically, so I wouldn't say that any one thing or, or I wouldn't say any one thing is is necessary by itself and I wouldn't say uh, to any one person you must do this to be effective um, it's more complicated than that uh, I think it's it's clear that when people do risk arrest and imprisonment that that has strong mobilizing effects um, that people can connect to the sacrifice of that and it, it does bring people out in in larger numbers very often. Um, so so if somebody is in the position to be able to do that, it's it's in my I think it's a good thing for them to do. Um, uh, but there are lots of different ways, you know, as, as I was saying with, with um, how civil disobedience works historically and, and presently, there are lots of different types of things that you can do. Um, now, um, yeah, for example, with hunger strike, I'm making a very different type of, of sacrifice and a very different kind of statement to what I would be with imprisonment. Um, I've been arrested before. I, I expect I will be again. Um, but it's to say, you know, is, is one of these more more effective or more powerful than the other one? It's, it's so web to, to who is listening to them and why um, that yeah, I don't think I can give you a straight answer, but in general, yes, arrest and imprisonment is, is very helpful to, for advancing a movement, but people shouldn't be shamed if they can't do that. People are in a variety of contexts. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Leon, I think you fixed your microphone, so you can come back. Let's see, is that working? Hey. Okay. Got you. Hi, hi, Tim and everyone else. Thanks for the talk. Very good. Um, I've typed out my question to keep it a bit concise, so I'll just stick to that. Um, and it was, how have your colleagues responded to suggestions of civil disobedience and what are the barriers to their participation? Yeah, really good question. Um, 
you know what, what's what's been really interesting with this is that um, before we started trying to mobilize scientists directly, um, a lot of people told us this won't work. You you won't be able to mobilize scientists. They're too kind of a, a privileged of a group. Um, and and for sure, like most most scientists don't want to do civil disobedience. Um, most parts of most populations don't want to do civil disobedience. Um, but actually, I think there is a, a deep uh, understanding still amongst many people and, and an appreciation that it is something that they should be doing. Um, now, the reasons why any one person takes action or doesn't are, are deeply personal. Um, I think one of the main problems in the scientific community is a kind of fatalism um, where people say, well, yeah, what's what's the point? We're basically locked in um, to destruction at this point. But also, I think it's important to note that that is itself a voice of privilege. Um, you don't you, you, you don't say, um, you know, well, I, my, my kids on life support, but uh, there's only a one percent chance that they're going to live. So I'm just going to turn it off. You know, most parents then would say they might live. We've got to try everything we can here. Um, I think part of the reason why scientists are, are kind of hesitant to do so is because it's it's very hard to throw away um, something that you feel that you've earned, um, even if actually it's, it's a bit of a birth code lottery um, in reality. Um, you know, raise Einstein alone in the woods and he couldn't invent a bow and arrow, let alone general relativity. But <laughs> that's kind of getting to the side. Um, so, uh, yeah, but, but so far, I mean, actually, we've got about 200 scientists around the world over the last few weeks who've conditionally committed to action, um, which I think is much more than, than, well, perhaps we weren't sure what to expect, but it's more than most people expected. Um, and I think there are signs that actually people are really coming to terms with this has to change now. We are at breaking point and science is included in that. So I don't know how well I answered your question there. But. Brilliant. That's good. Uh, Matt, do you want to ask your question? You post in the chat. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Tim. Actually, it's quite a practical question, but I was also partly thinking about the mobilised peace panel tomorrow and the that it seems the same propositions being made from both quarters. So I wondered if we, if you could speak to both of us that, that I understand rightly on the 25th and 26th, there was a two day teaching disobedience. And then on the weekend, the 27th and 28th, there's a more direct action, non-violent civil disobedience. And those being the four days of your hunger strike, I just wondered in terms of the possible interest here, we've got an arts university and a, and a university with a strong climate faculty, climate related faculty, if people are interested here, um, how I wondered how the um, hunger, you know, sitting at home getting hungry. I, I wondered how, how, as an action, how is that, um, or, or you know, how does it, how do you manage that? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so that's that. That is a question lots of people ask you about um, about hunger strike, and it is something we need to make sure to do right. Um, you know, part of it is that we're asking everyone who does hunger strike to uh, create a video diary each day um, where they kind of record their experiences, why they're doing it. At the moment, we're, we're getting video testimonials um, from activists who are doing all sorts of different things and we're releasing them slowly um, and creating compilations of them to explain to people why scientists are taking this step. Um, and we're building kind of networks through uh, YouTube, uh, through all kinds of stuff on the internet that somehow I'm already too old to really get. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that we can try and publicize these things through a variety of channels. Um, and there are lots of different people who are really open to helping with this. And, and you know, one thing that I want to make clear is that we have a really specific argument about science and academia, about why they should be leading and what credibility that gives to the movement more broadly if they step forward. Um, but it's it's by no means saying only scientists should be involved. So anyone who wants to be involved in some capacity, um, there's a lot of work to be done um, and a lot of different types of work to be done. So if you go to scientistsforrebellion.com, um, yeah, you'll be able to find some of the a bit more depth about what it is we're planning and how um, and how to get involved. 
Brilliant. Thanks. Thank Thanks. 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 Yeah. Great. Picking um, that up with Zach tomorrow. Great. Yeah, sounds great. So everyone do tune in to that one uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m. You can find the link on the Sustainability Week webpage, which I'll relay again at the end. Um, Tim, there's no questions from the chat. I had a question. I wonder if you'd be happy to answer. Um, I listened to a really stark podcast at the start of the year, um, Outrage and Optimism. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, and uh, I forget the name of the lady who's on it. Um, she was the lady who headed up the 2015 Paris Agreement along with two other gentlemen. Um, but uh, they talked about planetary boundaries and that's something I hadn't heard about before. And I wondered if you'd heard of planetary boundaries and when you first came across that and whether you could relay the sort of situation we're in with planetary boundaries. Sure, yeah, great. Um, so I don't know when I first heard about planetary boundaries, but um, uh, the, the basic idea is, is that um, there is it's quite quite a, quite a simple idea really there's a certain there's an amount of stuff that you can use um per year um without permanently kind of destroying or eroding that resource um so uh there are kind of different ways of formulating this you can say um yeah you can formulate it in terms of resource use or or um in fact, like ecological destruction or whatever, because because these these things do replenish over time, if even if slowly. Um, I think that in terms of planetary boundaries at the moment, with something like 1.7 Earths that we're using per year or something. Um, so basically, by about July or so, we'll have run out of of stuff we're allowed to use for the year. Um, I I it, I think it can be a really useful framing. Um, my only concern with it is that it, it treats, it, it still kind of works in the same paradigm where you treat the natural world as something which is there for our consumption and exploitation. And the reality is the more we bolster ecosystems and the less resources we consume and, 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 and mine for and, and, and destroy, um, the better. Uh, so when people talk about kind of limits of how, how high temperatures should rise, for instance, um, these, these aren't these aren't targets to aim for. Um, they they are catastrophic endpoints. Um, so yeah, uh, that's uh, planetary boundaries. Anyway. Yeah, thank you. I think I might have listened. To, that was really insightful. Thank you. And the other one that I just wanted to relay to the audience is um, maybe it was called something else like tipping points. But I realised uh, from this podcast that um, like three of the fifteen planetary tipping points, maybe it's called something else, have already been passed, and nine of them are at risk of reaching it. So that's also was about but no absolutely the 1.5 Earths is definitely a good metric but completely understand that yeah you've got uh maybe takes the um the focus away from something more important so great um zoe thanks for being patient thank you um yeah it's so uh, great to hear from you and um a little bit earlier you were talking about um the context of the the covid crisis and i just have this question that's been bubbling for a while really which is that we're in you know we've been in this kind of neoliberal situation for a long time where the individual greed is good has been the kind of preeminent value system that's been pushed to us and which has profoundly affected a lot of our young people I realize and I think it's at the root of a lot of the mental health crisis um, anyway um, in the context of the Covid crisis I feel that there's like things are shifting in society around that you know the the, the sort of the shaming of the covidiots the idea that you know these people they can't why don't they listen to the science you know it's really straightforward go and get your vaccine um and it's i don't know that i feel like there's a whole new set of conversations that are happening and i don't know where they're going and probably nobody does it's all in flux very much but in the context of suddenly everyone's shaming each other for not doing the thing for the greater good and I'm, I suppose that's my question is how does that new context change or affect conversations around taking action for the climate crisis for the greater good as opposed to you know the, the constant centralization of profit and externalization of cost it's like well suddenly it's the social norm not to do that anymore <laughs> and it's yeah question that bubbles yeah um no i i've been asking myself similar kinds of questions um 
so I, I mean, I can't give you any kind of a complete answer, but but I think it's it's a really interesting um, phenomenon that that we're seeing. Um, you know, part of what I would say is that um, yeah, I, I've said this before about the scientific community quite generally. Um, you know, if we hadn't have have accepted the same restrictions as everyone else in terms of COVID, um, then our warnings on COVID would have rung hollow. Um, so it's slightly different to, to what you're saying, but but just as an appeal again to that why scientists should take climate action, um, because if you don't if you don't live like it's real, people don't believe it. Um, now, in in terms of um, in terms of the social shifts and expectations that are happening, I mean, we'll have to see what what happens with those, um, how easily they can be co-opted. Um, or, or destroyed, but um, but I think amongst particularly, I mean, amongst the young um, in in Britain in particular, um, or especially, uh, I think there's a deep rejection of um, the kind of principles and values of, of neoliberalism um, and an understanding of its harm both both at a political, societal, and and personal level. Uh, I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, now, in terms of, of social good, I really hope, I mean, it, it's a strange thing about COVID is that it should be actually an extraordinary opposite, uh, opportunity. Um, it, you know, you, you get overnight kind of dramatic changes um, taking place and, and the government has to reveal its hand in this. You know, they, they can't any longer claim, oh, we don't have real power to, to institute the kind of sweeping changes that we need for a climate crisis. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You can stop everyone leaving their homes for a year. You can do something about this. You just choose not to. And I think there are ways in which that those kind of expectations have been blown apart, which will have deep ramifications for our politics for years to come. But I, I really don't know which way it's going to come down. Um, there's there's a kind of light timeline and there's a really goddamn dark timeline <laughs> and a whole shade of grey in between. Um, but yeah, thank you for your question. It's, it, we need to keep asking that. So, um, Leon, is that a new hand? I think it's a new hand. Do you guys ask for this? Yeah, another question. Um, so I was just wondering if, say, for example, in a scenario in like a year's time, um, scientist rebellion kind of goes well and we have like the Department of Science staff at the uni ready to mobilise, what kind of thing would you have them do ideally? Great. Um, so so I, I, I would kind of almost sidestep the question because I, I, I don't think what I would have them do is what would be optimal. Um, so what I would want to do, what we try and do at Scientist Rebellion is, is our, our mode of mobilization and organization is, is where we create a ever growing library of possible actions that people might want to conditionally commit to. Um, and then we put those groups of people who are interested in action together into local groups or, or international groups if it doesn't need to be a local action. Um, so, so what we would do is encourage people to look at the proposed actions and what we have guidelines and templates and, and support for. Um, and they can either choose something out of that or they can adapt it to make it their own or they can come up with their own idea. Anything nonviolent we support unequivocally. Um, so yeah, m my, um, my advice to them would be, you know your communities, you know everything. Um, in, in, you, you know about how best you could act better than we could hope to tell you. So we'd just seek to empower them to do so. Thanks. Yeah, that's really nice. I like the idea of the library of action. Yeah. I I think we've just lost Jake, who did tell us that he had to slip out uh, for for another meeting. Um, I I wondered if I could just follow up um, Leon Leon's question with with another thought. Uh, I've meant, I know I keep mentioning the panel tomorrow at one o'clock with Zach and Orla from Mobilised Peace will be joining us and a. Uh, um, a PhD alumni from Exeter, uh, Kesey Blake Mizen, and, and myself from the School of Arts. We've got three scientists and one arts trained person. And I, I'm just wondering if anyone here is from the School of Art or from the kind of arts and humanities generally. And I think 
there's something that I would really love to bring to that conversation, perhaps with question and answer, is um, the phrase that came to mind when you were talking, Tim, is about Extinction Rebellion being a science-led movement. But obviously, then, we're not all scientists. Most of us are lay readers, and we, we do, we, we're kind of, we're extremist enough to take the science seriously. And um, from, that, from that point of view, I think I, the, the whole pitch of Scientist Rebellion is very much sounds to me, to my ears anyway, is speaking to the authority of academics who understand because of their training and because of their, their research, how serious the situation is. Um, interestingly, for a lot of us in the arts, uh, that doesn't give us any understanding of it at all, actually. It just means, you know what it means, that people can be hypercritical and give you, tell you tell you everything about the reader and just this is all passing them by completely, you know. so. So I think reaching out to colleagues in what's now called the creative industries and, and, and looking to how do we how do we form alliances, interdepartmental alliances and support this movement more broadly within the faculties of, of universities is I'm not necessarily asking you to answer that, Tim, although I'd love if you've got an answer or anyone else here has, I'd be really interested. But that was a question I was hoping to bring to tomorrow's lunchtime panel, perhaps in quite practical terms towards the twenty fifth to twenty eighth of March. I think Zoe might be going to come in on that as well. So let's let yeah. Zoe say as well. Um, yeah, mainly I, I just actually wanted to uh, tout for a session that we're doing tomorrow afternoon at four as well, uh, where we're going to look at the spiritual dimensions of this, and mm. um, just different ways of conceiving our, our existence as yeah, spirits in a physical form, and and the kind of the ethics and the morality of the choices that we have to make around this, which I think is quite a huge element of it which sometimes gets forgotten when you're very fixated on you know the data or but but i think it's especially key to um yeah when and how you might make decisions to make sacrifice um and yeah so I'll leave that there so that's four o'clock and it's um environmentalism and spirituality and i think the others are going to be christians and i'm going to be the pagan buddhist and it's going to be kind of interesting <laughs> That does sound really interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll log in if I can. Um, um, I So, yeah, I think a really good um, point around academia. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of the divisions that we have in academia are just silly, frankly. I mean, the idea of a university is that there is one universe, university, and that there's, there's one kind of truth um, to the universe which we have to explore. And so, yeah, that's a very specific kind of critique of universities and how they're structured today. But um, in terms of, you know, if, if I were to rename or redo Scientist Rebellion now, um, I would prefer, I think, to call it something like Academic Rebellion. Um, it came out of our particular kind of our perspective, our, our how we look at um, the world, about our sort of backgrounds and, and approaches um, and a critique of that to our own community. So I don't regret it at all. Um, but certainly I think we should be working well outside of those compounds as well. It shouldn't just be um, just scientists, even if we have a particular um, argument there. So yeah, any kind of connections and, and uh, relationships we can have with arts departments or any other departments. Every time you talk to somebody new about this stuff, they tell you something that you don't know. Um, we can all learn from each other. And the more different the fields, the quicker you learn from each other. So absolutely, we should be doing that. Excellent. I've, I've got I've got one more out about that. I'll come to as well. But Zoe, you got I can see your finger up there. So. Yeah, I, just, <laughs> um, I think I just think scientists' rebellion is better than academic rebellion okay. um, because people often say, well, if it's that bad, you know, the scientists, if 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 we should believe them, why aren't they? Da, 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 da. Um, but also because academic, you know, oh well, that's academic, whether or not, blah, blah, and it's got this kind of connotation of not actually mattering that much, I suppose. <laughs> so no, I think it's really went I, I, I wanted to pick up that, that similarly, actually, I think Scientist Rebellion has a really clear, because it's got that basis of a kind of, or the authority of, of you know, owning, of people owning their authority. But alongside that, I just think that the work that um, Ronan and uh, Zach and Aura and the others have been doing with Mobilized Peace has been a fantastic ad this year, just partly in the change of, linguistics that it's sort of it's almost like tipping to the glass half full you know uh, extinction rebellion against extinction this is mobilized peace it's like that that this is actually about 
uh, bringing something alive and positive and good into motion. You know, there's a there's a massive yes behind it, not just a massive no behind it. Mm. And I I think that's got a capacity to to speak across all fields of academia. And it's obviously a university based initiative, student led university based initiative that we should all be getting behind to support. And so whether whether we support XR, SR, MP, whatever, you know, it's uh, yeah. We're all working towards the same goals um, and we should be working together and sharing resources totally. Um, it's a no brainer. We've gone for an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, Tim, you've given us lo loads of energy and really lo loads to think about. I, as we kind of come to an end, I just wanted to do, we've done some shout outs for what's coming up. So we've had two events tomorrow. Um, there's another one this week. So, so just before announcing the last thing this week, I'd just like to give a real uh, vote of thanks to Jake Causley and the sustainability team. It's been, I mean, we were talking, Zoe and I were talking earlier about the shift of the Overton window, as XR often refer to it. Um, it's been extraordinary right from day one to see Will Skeeping, the XR designer, um, on, a, on a panel with the vice chancellor at the university. And the momentum that Jake's built up by just welcoming every, uh, everything that the XR related conversation has had to bring this week has been really positive. But the, the last in a sequence of four or five things this week is on Thursday at 12.30. Um, there's an hours live stream talk with Bahana Yamin, uh, the environmental lawyer, cop author and activist uh, who came to notoriety in 2019 when she glued herself to the Shell building. Uh, she's a really eminent speaker. I was lucky enough to hear her record the talk. It's a really, really good, really good talk. And at 1.30, that same Teams Live event will then take us into an hour long Q&A with Bahana. So it's called Art After the Collapse, Creativity, Collaboration and the Cop at Glasgow. And it follows through on a lot of what uh, Tim's been talking about extremely well. And, and no doubt what we'll be talking about at both sessions. Um, does, Tim, do you want to come back with anything? Is there anything anything I've skipped over there? Or was there any kind of anything in closing? I don't want to hurry this to an end. If people are wanting to ask another question and you're wanting to speak back, I, I don't have to hurry off, but I just sense that maybe we would. Um, I, from, my, from my side, I think, um, I, I think, no, yeah, I, I, I've said most of what I think I hope to say. Um, and thank you for, yeah, really? for inviting me to speak. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thanks. Thank you for the talk and thank you for everything we're doing. And and uh, thank you in advance for what you're about to do on the 25th, the 28th. And I hope we can find ways to, to sort of support you uh, materially and in spirit from down here. So thank you. So thank good luck with all you're doing. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.